Buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por estar aquí. I'm going to turn into English uh, because our host is here. Um, so I think um, our objective for the time today, I think it will be uh, talking, maybe discussing about the issues that may be common between the United States and Spain, constitutional issues. Um, hopefully we can go through things like populism and the impeachment um, issues that women may face when running for office or taking a position of power. Um, and yeah, I think maybe we can open it for questions after you and I discuss for a little bit. Um, let me introduce you my friend, my dear friend Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. Uh, she is the Director of Retirement Security at the Economic Policy Institute, that's correct. It's, it's probably one of the most famous think tanks in, in the United States, based in Washington. Very famous, especially for progressive policy. Um, and also, uh, she's the founder of the Center for Retirement Security at the University of Georgetown, also in Washington, D.C. Um, she ran for office and she was lieutenant governor, is that the right name, uh, of Maryland uh, for two terms between 1995 2000 and 2003. You're doing very well. Okay, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> but you can fill in, exactly, you can fill in. <laughs> so, what are the, oh, the book. And then you are also the author of this book. You need to say the name though. The book is Failing America's Faithful and it's about religion and politics, which right. is a big issue in the United States. I don't think a big issue in Spain, but very, very difficult in our country. But that's not the country. title. It that is a the, very long title. I, do you think that it is interesting <laughs> that she is correcting me about the title of my book? <laughs> well, <laughs> that is very typical of Anna. <laughs> okay, what else? <laughs> Um, Kathleen is the daughter of Robert and Ethel Kennedy. Yes. Uh, you are also the oldest sibling of 11 children. Correct. Correct. You're doing really well, Anna. <laughs> the proud mother of four women. Yes. Right? Daughters and the grandmother to six grandchildren. Yes. Okay. More to come. Okay, so welcome to Madrid. I'm glad to be in Madrid. Yeah, we're very happy you're here. I think it's an honor for all of us to have you here. Um, I think maybe we can start, since I met you a couple of years ago in New York, I was, also, I was always very impressed because I think the first time you ran for office, it was in the 80s, Yes. correct? Um, and you are obviously a member of the Kennedy family, so you are not the first Kennedy in a public position, but you are the first women in that family who ran for office. So uh, what, what can you share your thoughts about what made you take that course? Well, as you know, um, many members of my family had run for office. In fact, my four members of my family, my uncle John Kennedy, my father Robert Kennedy, my uncle Ted Kennedy, and my uncle Sarge Shriver have all run for president. So four men have run for president. But none of the women ran for political office. Um, so when I was growing up, my, what I saw is women stayed home and had children. Now, my mother had 11 children. That, too, was intimidating. So it's not like it's easy to have 11 children. But it's, So what I learned from my family was values, but I didn't learn that women ran for office. Um, I learned that women volunteered, that they tried to make a difference. And it really wasn't until I had, I had gone to college, I went to law school, and I had worked on my uncle Teddy's campaign. I, I said he ran for president, and then he ran for senator again. And after that, a number of people said, you, Kathleen, you should run for office. And it was at the time of the women's movement. And so it wasn't my family that said I should get involved. It was the culture that said it was time for women to try to run. Not vigorously, but at least a little bit. So that taught me that you can come from the most wonderful family, and I do come from a fabulous family, but it was the signals that the culture sends you that help lift me up. And so it's really important at a university such as this one to teach people things that they might not learn from their own family, what it is that people can do. 
because you might come from a family that is uh, the, the society is prejudiced against and you have to get over that kind of prejudice and that's really what I learned for instance when I ran for Congress in 1986 I was told at that point I only had three children and I was told how can you run for office you have three children you should stay home and take care of your children and I said my father ran for president when he had 10 children. <laughs> and so I could see early on there was a big difference between women running for office and men running for office, which I'll get into, as you can imagine, in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there was probably a lack of role models, correct? There were really no role models for women running for office. There was um, Margaret Chase Smith of Maine, but other than that, it was very hard to find any role models in history or any place else. And what I've learned and what I think is real a challenge, I have, I'm gonna tell you my theory about women running for office, which applies to the United States and applies to many countries around the world, except for Spain. Spain, I have to tell you, is a total mystery to me, okay? <laughs> so I would like to understand Spain. In my three days here and in my other visits to Spain, I have not understood Spain. <laughs> so what, what is so difficult? What is <laughs> so let me tell you what I think about women um, in power. First of all, I have to ask you to do something. Everybody, please close their eyes for a moment. Now think of somebody in power. Okay, do you ever, everybody thought of somebody? Now open your eyes. How many chose a woman? Three people. Okay. <laughs> so that's kind of pathetic, right? Because I'm a here, I'm a woman, I'm trying to get you to think of women in power. <laughs> I've just been talking about the challenge of me running for office. I was trying to give you hints about women in power, right? Pathetic. I didn't do my job very well. <laughs> I only got four of you to raise your hands. Okay? You understand. Now, why is that? I have a theory. In the United States, we don't have an archetype, that is, we don't have a model in our soul about a woman in power because, number one, we're a democracy. So do, we don't have queens like they do in England, for instance, Queen Elizabeth I and Queen Elizabeth II and Queen Victoria, great queens. Um, now, we do have queens in Miami, <laughs> but that doesn't really count. <laughs> Um, that's number one. You have queens in uh, Spain, so that doesn't count for you. I don't understand. You had a great queen who launched a whole empire. You should be really proud of your queens. So I'm not going there for the moment, but I want you to think why that hasn't affected you or inspired you or something like that. Number two, we're a Judeo-Christian nation, um, and our god is male. Um, unlike, for instance, India, where they have 70 million gods and half their gods are female. So I wrote a book, remember, Failing America's Faithful? That's the name <laughs> of it. Anna. And when I wrote this book, Father Drynan, who's a Jesuit priest and he was a member of Congress, told me I should go on a retreat. So I went to a Jesuit retreat house um, and the retreat was a 10-day retreat, and it was called The Female Image of God. So I thought we would read a lot of readings about the female image of God. And it turned out, I didn't do my homework very well, so I don't know why you're listening to me today, but here you are. It was a 10-day silent retreat. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so for 10 days, I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody, but I just prayed to a female god. Do you know there's a female god in the Old Testament called Sophia? Did you know that? You're the oh, one man, raise your hand, he has heard of the female god in the Old Testament. Okay, very few people know about the female god. Are you a professor? No. You're just smart. <laughs> You're what? 
you're a re you're just a Republican. A publisher. <laughs> publisher. Oh, you're a publisher. You're smart. Okay. Very good. <laughs> anyway, so if you pray to a female god and you're a woman, I'm going to tell you what happens. It's very empowering. It's very different to pray to a female god than to a male god. Because you think, oh, she's like me. We created the earth, not just men. Do you get that point? It's a little hard to understand in two minutes. It's a little, if you did it for 10 days, you would get it, okay? <laughs> and so praying to a female god is very important. If you don't have female gods, like India, it's hard. Now, the Catholic Church is very interesting. I went to Catholic, Catholic school for 10 years. And in our Catholic school, we were taught by nuns. And the nuns actually liked Mary more than Jesus. Do you understand that? I don't know if that's true in Spain. I just suspect it's not. But it is true in Latin America. So all over Latin America, you have Queen Mary. And she's very powerful. You don't have Jesus as much. You have Queen Mary. And as a result, you have presidents, women presidents of Argentina, Brazil, mm. and Chile. Because Mary is so powerful. <laughs> so I make two suggestions. Get more Mary here. <laughs> So let, let, let's stop. You think you want to stop me? Yeah, no. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. There's a third issue. And, and I'm, I'm going away from queens and from kings and from gods. I'm going to just move to uniforms next, okay? <laughs> All the men in this room are basically wearing a uniform. They have a jacket on, <laughs> except for you. They have a tie on. But it's close enough. You're wearing pants, a jacket, and a shirt. And you kind of have the same hairstyle, if you have hair. <laughs> the women, in contrast, have lots of different hairstyles. Some have long hair. Some have short hair. Some have colored their hair. Some have a knot. Some have dresses on. Some have pants on. Some have suits on. By every dress that a woman is wearing, another woman and another man is making a judgment about her. Is she beautiful? Is she not? Is she a businesswoman? Is she not? Is she a mother? Is she not? And we are all making judgments about what she's wearing. For instance, and I'm going to end at this point. You don't need to end. It's OK. okay. You tried to interrupt me earlier. <laughs> I saw that. For instance, when I was first elected lieutenant governor in Maryland, there was a big story about me. And the first paragraph said, Kathleen came to this event, and she wasn't wearing lipstick, and she wasn't wearing rouge. The second article about, and I was, just so you know, wearing lipstick and rouge, but I have dry skin, so it had faded. <laughs> Some of you have beautiful skin, not me. That's not my fault. I couldn't do anything about it. Okay, but, it's, but I got judged for it, okay? Sorry. Lo, lo siento? Yeah. Second story about me, as lieutenant governor, I was put in charge of the state police, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Parole and Probation, the Department of Juvenile Justice, and $100 million worth of grants for criminal justice. OK? Does that sound important? Si? I know a few words in Spanish. Yes, important. Um, and guess what the first paragraph of that article was? I wasn't wearing heels. My heels were only this long, not that long. So I learned that if you're a woman, you are judged very harshly on how you look. If we had a woman, we don't know what a woman in power looks like, 
so we criticize what women look like. That's the challenge for a woman in the United States. I suspect because in Spain, you haven't taken Queen Isabella to heart, I don't know why. <laughs> you haven't taken the Queen Mary to heart, I don't know why. You're even in worse shape, I don't know why. You can answer the question. You think I was gonna do all the talking? <laughs> Do you want to answer? You're, you're afraid what? I'm not from here, so I don't know. Oh, you're not from Spain. Where are you from? Ecuador. 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 Oh, so in Ecuador. You got, you got a male. Eva? No, no, we don't have You don't have any. No. But you have, you're at least from countries where they, in Ecuador, do they, because they, I, th I think of Mary Guadalupe. No, no, that's more Mexico, that's yeah. more Mexico. Yeah, that's Mexico. Anyway, I don't know what, how it is in Ecuador. Okay, anybody else want to answer? I think we have <coughs> virgins all over the country. <laughs> Every town has a virgin. Very important one. Uh, Virgen de Pinar. Is she powerful? Extremely. The patron of Spain is... Uh, well, we have two, a man, which is Santiago, uh, and a woman, which is Pilar, the Virgin de Pilar. So it is not the lack of virgins. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the lack of virgins. Can I take that home with me? <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless. <laughs> I think of Germany, if you think of the Norse gods, there are a lot of w strong women Norse gods. What? And in Greek? And in Greek, Athena. Yes. Athena. Yeah. Uh, Hera. Yeah. All these are goddesses. Yes. Of course, Ceres is more important. What? Ceres. Ceres, yes. Ceres in the Olympo is yeah. the, the highest god. But they all are there. Yeah. And they are goddesses. Power. Is it, I just think it's an interesting question. <laughs> okay, well, I clearly haven't intrigued any of you, but <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> so I guess Anyways, to think about. I guess, um, okay. Can we talk maybe before moving into the Trump situation, which I think we are all very interested <laughs> to discuss. I am actually very curious. Uh, what do you think will need to happen? in Spain or in the US for actually a woman to become president. And, and the, uh, let me put you some context. I think it's very interesting, having lived in the US for 11 years, I'm moving back to Spain, how in the last 10 years, I have seen some sort of progress in the way American women uh, act in a unified front, right? More and more, which is, was not the case before, even about, female Democrats and voters, they don't necessarily support a female candidate, correct? Am I wrong in assuming that's correct? Yes. So, um, well, I think there, as you know, in the 2018 election, many more women voted and they voted Democratic. And more women were voted to the House of Congress. That, that is a Trump election. Oh, the and midterm. That, in the, the midterms. Midterm. And that was a reaction to Trump, absolutely. And the good news is the women who won looked differently. When I won yeah. in 1994, there was kind of a uniform for women. Apparently I didn't make it, but I learned to wear heels and I learned to brush my hair and put on permanent lipstick. So that was very helpful. 
But now women are looking very different, and there's all sorts of models, and I think that's been very helpful hmm. for women. Um, more women senators and more women in, um, in governorships. So that's been very helpful, and there's a real reaction against Trump, particularly among white women with college degrees. They used to vote Republican, and now they're voting Democratic, and that's a big change. Hmm. Um, the only women who are now voting for Trump are non-college educated white women. All the other women, African American women, 98% for Democrats. Hispanic women, over 80% for Trump, for, uh, for Democrats. And um, white women have switched if they have college degrees. So women now are by far gone the other way. And they, I, they will vote for whoever the Democrats nominate, I think. Um, as you saw in the last, in Iowa, um, Elizabeth Warren what came in third, um, and I don't know if there is a fear among Democrats, which is because of what happened to Hillary, that we want to make sure we beat Trump, and we're worried that if we elect, uh, there are definitely some women um, that we want to make sure we beat Trump, and we're not sure that we can nominate a woman to do that. That is, there is, there is that fear that is an underlying fear in the United States among Democrats. But I think after Trump is f finished, I think it will open up for more women to run and more women to win. It was very exciting that that many women w won ran this year. In the seats in the primary, in the midterm, correct? Yeah. Yes. At the House. Okay. So um, before moving into the topic of the primaries, which I think is fascinating, and we should talk about Iowa for sure, um, what happened, but uh, today is the day, correct? Today we will learn whether Trump is found guilty and removed from office. I think we learned that a long time ago. Anna. <laughs> that, he, that he will not be removed. He will not be removed. But yeah, he might be guilty. Yes, I think, so as you know, I mean, I'm sure all of you know this, that um, Nancy Pelosi never wanted to go through an impeachment hearing for the very reasons that you can see. Um, Trump's um, numbers have gone up. He's the most popular that he's ever been today, right after the, at the end of the impeachment. Mm -hmm. And why has that happened? That's the same thing that happened to Clinton. I was lieutenant governor when he was going through impeachment and his numbers went up because people like me were so mad that he was being impeached over a blow job. We thought, you've got to be kidding us. This is stupid. And all the people who liked Clinton got angry and we were for him and the same thing happened to Trump when you get your en enemies angry they come out for you so the, the, the in politics the politics of America right now is anger so your your side is that angry or their side is angry so you don't want to get the other side angry you want them to just think there's not an election and go away. <laughs> and going through an impeachment is the worst thing you do because you've waken up the other side. Yeah. And you, the last thing you want to do is waken them up. So Nancy Pelosi did not want to go through an impeachment hearing at all. But she did in the end. She went through it because it was so clear that he had broken the law. And she thought it was her duty at one point duty, at least as a Democrat. That's the thing with Democrats. We want to do the right thing. This is Maureen Dowd, in the New who writes for the New York Times, said, it, once again, we see the Democrats wanting to do the right thing and the Republicans just wanting to win. Yeah. And doing the right thing didn't help us politically. It hurt us politically. That's actually what happened. So that most Democrats did not care very much about impeachment just didn't, um, and the Republicans did care, and so that his numbers went up and ours didn't go up. I'm just giving you what happened. So the better that impeachment is finished, it helps us because it gets us off the stage of impeachment, and we move on to other issues that people will pay attention to, which is how terrible Trump is, we like that, how unfair it is, how he got off, and that will be a much better argument than talking about impeachment.
Hmm. It's a serious. I don't. I'm not saying this with any pride, or any joy, or any happiness. I'm just talking about the powers of politics. Not telling you anything you probably don't know already. <laughs> No, but the reality is that okay. So these all started in September last year, if I remember correctly. So it took the House for months to run this investigation, and then all of a sudden, sometime mid January, if I recall correctly, um, Nancy Pelosi, also a very strong woman, uh, kind of um, I think she called the press right and came up with a group of lawmakers a group of seven, if I recall correctly, um, and just said, you know, listen, we have enough evidence, so we're going to move this into the trial stage, right? Into the Senate. Is that well, the it's, I, I don't know how you do it in Spain, but basically you have, you do re research, like you're a police officer. You first do a research, then you indict somebody. Mm -hmm. So the House is the indictment phase like a grand jury. I, I mean, I, I don't, if, if somebody knows the law, they'll know it better than I do to make the comparison to Spain. No, it's, there is no such a thing. There is, the process is so different. That's why it's so interesting for us to discuss well, the process. Well, I can, I can only compare it to yeah. <laughs> the American process. You have a grand jury, you indict somebody, and then once you indict somebody, you send it to the trial. And then they go to trial, and the, the Senate was the trial, and they had a trial that lasted, you know, two weeks. Or so. But what's so interesting is that the trial, so the jury are the senators. That's correct. Right? So, yeah. And they stay there yes. for days, just listening to a trial. They remember well, some like, of the them jury. Stayed there. there was a lot of people left. They kind of, they kind of, as we all know, they were very bored. They never <laughs> had to sit and listen to anybody else forever. But they did, some of them. And they didn't like it. Because, as you could see from many of the Republican senators in the last two days, what they've said is Trump did something wrong, but it didn't rise to the level of impeachable offenses. And why did they say that? Because an impeachment is a political act. It's, it, they're senators. And they looked at their constituents, and their constituents like Trump, they didn't want to lose the election. The only two people who thought they could get away with it was Romney because he comes from Utah, which is a Mormon state. You have Mormons, right? You have Mormons in Spain. I s you don't have Mormons in Spain. You've heard of Mormons. <laughs> you guys, I don't know. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Thank you. I, a little audience participation would be great. Because <laughs> I don't know if you can understand what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about, Mormons. Mormons don't like Trump. So Romney could get away with trying to organize against Trump because he comes from a state where they don't like Trump. That's number one. Susan Collins, who was the other senator, is in a very tough election in Maine. She's the only Republican in, this, in a part of the country that's called New England and she is up for re-election, and there are a lot of people in New England who don't like Trump. So she had to, she came out against, uh, she came out for getting information. I don't know what she's gonna vote, of, vote on today, so we'll see what, how she votes. But the rest are scared, because their constituents all like Trump. He's done a very good job. Um, and people have said he's the most powerful Republican or powerful president we've ever had. Hmm. And it shows the power of populism, which is to divide one part of the country against the other, which he has done beautifully. And it means that nobody can listen to anybody who says something critical of Trump. So he's done a very good job at it. I mean, you can say you don't like it, which I'm happy to say, but it doesn't mean he hasn't done that very well. So our job, the Democratic job over the next nine months, is to get our vote out and um, get our vote energized. And that's gonna be tough because we are a divided party, as you can mm -hmm. see, between the Bernie Sanders part of our party 
and the Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg part of our party, we're not united and we're not, and so we've got some challenges ahead of us. But I think we're gonna win. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Do you wanna hear? Yeah, yeah. Yes! <laughs> We're going to win because um, we lost, two of the states that we lost last time were Pennsylvania, very big state, mm -hmm. and Michigan. And this time they're both, both head, uh, headed by a re Democratic governor, M Pennsylvania and Michigan. And um, when we usually have a Democratic governor, you can get the vote out in a way that you can't when you don't have a Democratic governor. They were both headed by Republican governors four years ago. Um, and if we win those two states and everything else stays the same, we win. And we should win both those two states. So there's gonna be a lot of problems. Um, you may have seen that George Soros said that Facebook is very interested in getting Trump to win, uh, which is scary, and I think it's true. But I do believe that uh, unless they actually hack the voting machines, we'll win. So I give you that as a gift of peace for the next nine months. <laughs> <laughs> so you pointed out a very interesting, um, so you pointed out that in the US, the impeachment is a political move. But to be honest, I mean, it's, it's only political, it's very much a political thing in Spain because the main difference is that we, in the similar process, it's not an impeachment, it's very different, it's a parliamentary system. So what happens here is that um, what happens, we don't need to accuse anyone of, of abuse of power, for instance, just to try to remove them from office. That has only happened one time, which is very unique. Um, in the U.S., how many times? Three, four times? Uh, well, three times, and once we tried to impeach Nixon, and he resigned before he went, because it was yeah. clear that he would be impeached. But actually impeach just one president, correct? Well, nobody's actually been removed from office. Nixon's the only person who left office, but he resigned. Yeah. So one president was found guilty, correct? Nobody has nobody. Been, nobody's okay. ever been found guilty, so because Nixon resigned rather than be found guilty. Yeah, yeah, before. Yeah, but there has to be an accusation, right? Someone yeah. needs to break the law to actually, yes. or have enough evidence, yes. right? Which in this case is very well, obvious. You say enough evidence. It's everything is done is a political action. Yeah. Just, just so you know, this is the Congress of the United States. This is the Senate of the United States. These are political actors. And yet they need to find evidence, which is making me think it's like a real trial, but it's, well, it's don't, not, it's don't what you're think saying. That way. Don't think that way. It's not a real trial, it's not. Everything is in the eye of the beholder, as real trials are in the eye of the beholder. I, I don't know if you do, again, because I don't know your system, but right now in the United States, I mean, I'm getting off subject, and I, I apologize to the publisher for doing this. <laughs> But if you are rich in the United States and you, you um, hire a, a lawyer, you, spend, you can spend millions of dollars checking your jury pool. Jury pool. Do you know what that means? No. Okay, you know what a jury is? Yeah. Do you have jury trials here? Yeah. So a jury pool means that, for instance, if you have a black, an African-American um, who's accused of murdering a white woman, let's just pretend that's the tr trial, and the black man is O.J. Simpson, let's just pretend, you want to make sure that everybody in the jury pool is African-American, okay? And there are no white women. Is that clear? <laughs> that's what I did, I mean, and that's the most obvious Things. So you spend all the money you can to make sure that you've got a jury pool that is, looks totally black. Okay, that's just like, I'm being totally simplistic with that story. But you can do it in much more subtle ways. Are you a lawyer? Do you have a lawyer in your family? Have you ever been robbed? I mean, all those kind of things. I'm just being as, as I didn't want to go into great detail, but you get the point. Yeah. 
it is a political act. If you want to get into a real dirt, meaning that it's never going to get anywhere because it's rich and somehow. You're going to choose your jewelry pool. That's exactly right. So you will never be found guilty. <coughs> to be very difficult to find them guilty, that's exactly right. Depends on the judge. But I'm just saying, there are people in the United States who get hired at huge amounts of dollars to make sure that they choose the best jury. And the defense, the, the prosecutor is a government official, so they can't spend the money. It's the defense who ju chooses the jury pool. It's, it's like gerrymandering. Have you heard of gerrymandering? It's like the voters, it's like the Congress chooses their voters. You spend millions of dollars to make sure that the voters are the ones who will vote for you. The voters don't choose you, you choose the voters. It's really wonderful. <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm not working on the jury pool issue, but I am trying to work on the gerrymandering issue, just so you know. Thank you. And it's changed in California. Anyway, I know that's off what you wanted to hear about today. I'm, I'm, I apologize. No, that's very interesting. <laughs> Do you want to discuss Iowa and what happened, the mess? Is anybody interested in Iowa? Yes. <laughs> Shall we pretend, do you want me to act, do you, do you all want to, want to pretend, what, see what happened in Iowa? <laughs> Are you star tired of sitting down? <laughs> I mean, we could, we could have you be Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg. Do you want to do that or not? How, okay, this is your, I'm giving you a choice. <laughs> we could pretend here that we're at an Iowa caucus. Or I could just talk. <laughs> I want to hear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you vote. <laughs> so nice of me. Okay. How many want to be told and lectured to, and how many want to pretend we're at an Iowa caucus? Okay, lecture, two. Pretend you're at an Iowa caucus. Yes! <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, this is great. Okay, I'm gonna get five candidates. Who wants to be Bernie Sanders? Who wants to, you don't have to be Bernie Sanders. Who wants to represent Bernie Sanders? Okay, you stand over there. Just a minute, this is so great. <laughs> okay, who wants to represent Pete Buttigieg? Pete Buttigieg. Oh, you're the perfect person. <laughs> he's young, he's handsome. What more do you want? You, you can stand over there. You have to get around. Okay, who wants to be Elizabeth Warren? Great. You stand over there. to be Joe Biden? That's what happened in the Iowa caucus. Who wants to be Joe Biden? Okay. 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 Now, each of you who decided you wanted to do that, one of you, okay, who has paper and pencil? You are going to stand with her right now. <laughs> you have paper, you go with him. You go with him. And who else has paper and pencil? Oh, a Amy Klobuchar. You, could you be Amy Klobuchar back there? You're Amy Klobuchar. What's your name? Maria. Maria, you'll be Amy Klobuchar. You go, babe. you be Amy Klobuchar and get somebody with a pencil and papers to stand with you. <laughs> So you can count your votes. Okay, now the rest of you go stand with the candidate you like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who is Elizabeth Warren? You are?
Okay, excuse me. If you cut me off. Hello? Can it's only for the camera. You have to turn the camera on because I'll go get deaf. I mean, I'll go, <laughs> not deaf, you know, but I can't talk. Okay, so this is the deal. Bernie has nine, Warren has seven, Biden has four, Amy has seven, and Pete has eight. Now, um, you each have to get... 15%. Who's good at math? <laughs> I, I know already that Biden did not get 15%. This is seven? Yeah. 18 and 17, so this is 35. So, so, so nine out of 35 is equal. <laughs> <laughs> tell me what 15% of 35 is. Okay, so the, the sad news is this. Biden, who was my candidate, just so you know, didn't make it. The rest of you got something. So Biden's people have to disperse. And now you can go as a group to somebody you like. So remember, th this is the deal. Now why didn't Biden do well at the Iowa caucuses? I know you wanna know why. I wanna know why, I'll tell you. Number one, the Iowa caucus is all white and Biden's strength is African Americans. And two, Biden's second strength is people who are like me, old. And we're too tired to go out at night, not like you guys who are so young and vigorous. So we're kind of old, and we don't want to go out at night. So the four Biden people, you have a choice. You have to talk to each other, and you can decide we are middle of the road, and we want somebody like Pete because he's like us, middle of the road. Or you can decide, we like Amy, because she's kind of middle of the road, but she's a woman, and can she win this year? Or you might like, we like Bernie, because he's old like us. You probably don't decide that. Yeah. Or you might decide you like Elizabeth Warren. Or you might decide we're not gonna change. Or you each like one thing. So, so you get the points, they have to decide. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
votes there. Did any of you go and try to get those votes? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. You did. Well, then you're good. Pete's campaign was pathetic. They didn't even walk across the room. <laughs> Warren's campaign, doubly pathetic. They were so close, they didn't even try three feet away. You guys are also self-interested. You were all like looking at your cell phones. <laughs> Terrible. Now, in a real Iowa caucus, I'm just telling you, in a real Iowa caucus, you would have all brought cookies, potato chips, and you would have bribed your friends and said, come eat with us. We'll talk to you about our candidate. And you would have spent time giving them a little cookie as you're describing why Biden's not really good, but Pete's good. But you, none of you did that. You didn't even try to capture them. I'm not going to recount it. You get the point. Thank you very much. <laughs> difficult the Iowa caucus yeah. is. Yeah. Now just think, you only had 35 people. What if you had 1,200 people? And you had to do that. A lot of cookies. And with no cookies. cookies. Yeah. And it, it takes two hours. So it's very prejudiced against old people, uh, disabled people, uh, people who have children who have to stay and watch their kids at home. So there's a whole group of people who find it very difficult to go to an Iowa caucus. For instance, I'm working on a project in the United States that's, I don't know how you vote in Spain, but vote by home. Mm -hmm. So you don't have, so I want as many people to vote as possible. The Iowa caucus is, makes it as difficult to vote as possible. Yeah. Terrible idea. Yeah. And it's the first in the nation that has a very much power. So it's small, terrible. <laughs> okay. You've got my idea about that. So what happened to the Iowa caucuses? I'll tell you what happened. I'm going to take my jacket off. <laughs> the, um, so last time, there was a big question whether Hillary won or Bernie won, because it was so close. And so Bernie was very angry, because he thought he won, and Hillary was declared the winner. So he said, I want three things to be reported. Normally, you just report the winner, right? So this time, he said, I want three things to be reported. First, that first list, seven for him, four for Biden, all that. Then I want the second group to be reported, how many people voted. And then I want a third group, you know, which, which switched one 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 the other, and then third, who won how many votes. So that's three different votes. <laughs> then we'll give you an app, technology, to figure it out. Okay? They, they, just, they developed an app. But they didn't train any of the people in the Iowa caucuses how to run the app. Hmm. Pazzo. So the people had no idea how to run the app. They didn't know how to put the numbers into the app. They did, couldn't get it in. Then, so they said, screw that. We'll just do it by paper. So they started doing it by paper. Again, three times. You can see I had difficulty, and I only had 35 people. Okay? I didn't know what 15% of 35 was. 
and this is a really smart room, right? Mm -hmm. You're at a university. You're about the smartest <laughs> Iowa caucus there is. <laughs> and none of, it took you how many, how many minutes to figure out what 15% of 35 was? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not easy. You know, in other words, nobody could figure it out. And you have to figure it out that moment because you don't know how many people are going to come to the caucus. You know, you can't plan ahead. So you have to do that. And then you'd have to figure out seven is how many delegates? Seven is how, what percentage of 35, how many delegates does that give you? So that's, I didn't, do you understand? I skipped a lot of horrible. I mean, I wasn't very good at it either. I mean, I'm not telling you I was good at it. I was just trying to show you how difficult it is. So then people started calling in the numbers and the Iowa campaign put people on hold for 90 minutes because they couldn't, they're 1,200 precincts, <clears throat> literally 1,200. So people would wait on hold for 90 minutes and then be cut down. So that's what happened. The good news is we're never gonna do Iowa again. <laughs> <laughs> you mean here or <laughs> in caucus? We'll never do that. It, they're so mad at Iowa. Oh, that People are happen. furious because Pete Buttigieg thinks he won. He didn't. So to win Iowa, when you win Iowa, are you bored by this or do you want me to keep talking? I mean, it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> when you win Iowa, normally the person who wins Iowa stands up gives a fabulous speech and it goes into New Hampshire, which is next Tuesday, mm -hmm. and says, I won Iowa. And then all these people say, wow, he must be great. Let's go vote for Pete. But because we've had two days where we don't know whether he won, whether we don't know whether Bernie won, we don't know whether there was fraud, we don't know whether there was any truth to it, there's total doubtful, you know, I mean, I just told you my story, but I mean, who knows it's true? I'm just <coughs> telling you what I read and know about and what I suspect is the truth. So he doesn't get the bump he wants. And he spent all, so when you have a campaign, as you know, those who have run for office, you have a certain amount of money, unless you're Bloomberg. And, and Bloomberg's not putting any money in Iowa. So, Pete Buttigieg and Kamala Harris put all their money in Iowa with the hope that if they get, win Iowa, it will give them a bounce. Mm -hmm. But if you win Iowa, you expect a bounce. And he put all his money in Iowa, is he gonna get a bounce? Because he didn't get the big night. Hmm. But historically, it had happened, right? Like the candidate who won Iowa normally wins the primaries. Not always, but they, it gives them a bounce. But it's not clear if it'll happen this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's really a terrible. It's good for the Democratic Party not to have it, but it's a disaster. I mean, because it was the State of the Union last night, so Trump could make fun of the Democratic Party. He was just one Im impeachment last night. So our party right now doesn't look happy, so I'm really glad to be in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I think in the long run, and I believe, you know, it, we'll win, we'll win the election. I mean, I just the the, the, the point. It's going in our direction. It was just a very bad two two weeks, mm -hmm. and which Nancy knew. I mean, she knew she knew she knew what she was doing. So, any more questions, or we? What do you think? I do have. Oh. Thank you very much. Anyway, you were very good sports. <laughs> and now you've learned a lot. So that's fun. Yes. I have uh, like a personal good question for you and like uh, some, some thing about the electoral college. Yes. The first question is, uh, are you, you are, uh, I see you are very, very confident that the Democrats will win the election. Uh, are, were you the same uh, confident when no, I didn't. I thought there was a good shot that she wouldn't win. And I'll tell you why. One, as you know, I was a woman running for, go I don't know if I told you, I ran for governor of Maryland um, after I was lieutenant governor, and I was the front runner, and I didn't win. 
And so I knew how difficult it is for a woman to run in a position of power. I ran in 2002, which was right after 9-11. So I, I was very well aware that there are moments that women can do well, and that was a terrible time for women to run. So I'm, I'm very well aware of um, historical moments. It, t it turned out to be my moment was terrible. Number two, I campaigned for Hillary around the country. And I would go, I campaigned in Pennsylvania, and I would go 75 miles into Pennsylvania, and I would only see huge Trump signs and no Hillary signs. I didn't think that was a good, <laughs> helpful. And three, where I live in Maryland, I chose a place in Maryland. Um, you probably have places like this in Spain. Where I live, it's very nice. It's like right on the water, very, very nice, very lovely. But right behind me, it's very poor. It's like a blue collar. I don't know if you use the word blue collar. No, no, no. What is it called? No, I. Barrio Obrero, sí. Working class. Yeah, working class. Yeah. Working class. And so in my, the town that I live in, there, there are only Trump signs. And the only Hillary sign was put her in prison. So, and I'm in Maryland, which is Democratic state. So I was very conscious that she wasn't doing well even in a Democratic state. She wasn't doing well in Pennsylvania, which is a swing state. When I campaigned for her, people would say, oh, Kathleen, you're the most enthusiastic person we've seen for Hillary. And I thought, if I'm the most enthusiastic, then they, and then they should be pushing me more out. It, it, I just, it didn't, it didn't ring that this was going in the right direction. Yeah, and the second question is about, uh, for, in my opinion, Republicans manage the electoral college better than Democrats, and uh, gerrymandering are, are, they are very efficient in gerrymandering. So, what are you, uh, like, Democrats, what are they planning, what Democrats are planning to do different this, this time? Because we know Hillary won the popular vote, but that's not enough. Yeah, that, so there's, so just so you know, there's a difference between the electoral college and gerrymandering. Yeah. You know that. Okay. So um, gerrymandering, electoral college just has to do with what happens in the states. Gerrymandering has to do with who wins in Congress. Um, and so what happened in 2010, uh, Obama was in office, Republicans were mad at Obama, so they won the state houses in 2000. This is really getting into details. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna take Kathleen, shush. But just briefly, it mattered, we, re, we redo the districts every 10 years. So if the Democrats win in 2020, like we won in 2018, we'll be able to redo the districts. So that will be important. In 2010, the Republicans won all the state houses. If we can win the state houses in 2020, we can redo the districts and gerrymander in our favor. That's the simplest way to understand it. I mean, it's such details that, I, I mean, I, it's like gory details. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, social media, me, media had a big impact in uh, last elections, right? And, and I don't know if Democrat, Democrats have some strategy to, to, to make, make it different this time with social media. That's a really good question. Well. We are trying. The problem is, the challenge is, we've learned this word, I don't know if you, you, we've learned, you probably learned this in some sort of writing, you're never supposed to say the problem. <laughs> you're supposed to say the challenge, not the problem. <laughs> the opportunity. The opportunity. Oh, that's I good. do that all the time. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Um, the opportunity is, no, this is the challenge. Uh, this is not an opportunity. The challenge is uh, that George, this is what I said earlier, that George Soros has said that Facebook yeah. is in the pocket of uh, Trump. See, the question is when you, oh, when Facebook really hurt Hillary Clinton, I mean, I don't know if I should say this. <laughs> Yeah. 
the right wing sued Facebook and said they were being unfair to the, to the left because Facebook is lefty. So um, Facebook said, okay, we're gonna change our pattern. And the right wing knew they were, what they were doing. And on January 20th, 2017, I did not stay in Washington and go to the inaugural, nor did I go to the Women's March. I went down to Florida to see how we could plan for the next four years. There's this group that I went with. They're very smart. What group? Oh, Who is in the group? It's called Media Matters. It's, they're very smart. I, I can tell you about them. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. They're, they're famous. They're very, they're really brilliant. Um, and they showed a chart that when, the, when Facebook settled the case, <coughs> ads on Facebook, which had been sort of even like this, Republican, Democrat, went like this. Republican ads went up like that, and Democrat ads went like this. Absolutely on one day. Because the Republicans stopped allowing Democrat, the Facebook stopped allowing Democrat ads and just allowed Republican ads. And you could see it. There was a chart there. It was absolutely clear. And so what has happened now is that um, Trump has become friends with um, you know, what's his name, the head of Facebook, and Sheryl Sandberg, who used to be a Democrat. Remember, she used to work for Larry Summers. And um, they've made kind of a deal. You don't regulate us, and we'll let you do whatever you want with the ads. And we will not say these ads are untrue. So we won't regulate any of the political ads. So they can have all the lies go through, and they won't regulate it. So that's... That's pretty horrendous. It's completely awful. And that's what's happening with the technology companies. For instance, um, the head of Facebook, um, who you know said my father was a great hero of his, talked about how great my father was, got on the RFK board, my father's board, you know, the board that, uh, he got off the board because he doesn't want the Republicans to overly re regulate Facebook. It's a problem. If you're in business, you do not want to cross the regulators in a government. I'm sure that's true here. I mean, I'm not saying the United States is any different. But Europe has been much better on tech regulating um, yeah. the technology companies. So I, I want to, and you've been much better at regulating um, crypto <coughs> people, terrorists, than we have. I mean, you, you've just done a much better job. So I want you to continue doing your great job because you're doing them. You're not as <laughs> Because you're, the way you fund your campaigns is so different, um, you, you do a much better job. So I, I want to congratulate all of you in the European Union. You really do much better. <laughs> Thank you. You should be very pleased with that. Is regulating the internal election in the United States, Democrats have, have to make something with that? Or, or are you going just to say? No, I, look, we're trying. I, all I can say is we are trying. And we are up against a very big gi a giant that is difficult. That's what I'm telling you. That is the truth. It's very difficult. When you have the Russians, who are still against us, when the government turns its way against us, when, the re when they won't regulate the bad ads, when they put lies, it's, I'm just giving you, these, this, this is the challenge we're up against. But I still believe we will win. So just so you know, I'm giving you the challenge, but we're still gonna, and we came very close, remember last time, um, uh, despite all the Russian. Thank you, I think we're, we're kind of done. I think we're done. I mean, I think it's always good to end on a good note rather than a depressing <laughs> note. I think that was a really depressing question and I don't want any more depressing questions. So I wanna thank you for all participating in the Iowa caucuses. You now know why we have a few problems in the United States, but I give you peace because we are gonna win the next election. Not in a way that I felt last year, last four years ago, but I really feel confident this time. Thank you very much. <laughs>